And on to our next speaker, uh, Dr. Matthew Perry, who is a statistician in the Department of Mathematics and Statistics at the University of Otago. He applies statistical and mathematical modeling to problems in epidemiology, uh, epigenetics and agri-tech. Matthew will present how to understand modeling of COVID-19 spread. Matthew. Thanks very much, Jackie. Uh, and thank you very much to the organizers for letting me talk to you today about understanding modeling of COVID-19 spread. Um, I know you'll be a bit alarmed that a mathematician maybe or a statistician is talking about this uh, area. So I thought I'd lead up front with a quote from Isaac Bogosh, who's an epidemiologist in Canada. And he said, we need to put the clinical back into clinical epidemiology. So this is just to reassure you that um, I'm not going off in some uh, pie in the sky mathematical uh, framework just for the sake of it, but that we really are trying to address real epidemiological questions. Now I should point out that um, Isaac Bogosh is one of the first people to actually uh, point out that COVID-19 was a serious threat and with pandemic potential uh, very early on. So a quick outline, I'm told with short talks you shouldn't give an outline, but I thought it might be helpful anyway. Um, we'll talk about three things, um, probably the second one uh, in more detail, but the first one is what are the models of disease spread for? And here when I talk about spread, I'm generally going to be talking about spread in a population, and it's only later on that I'll talk briefly about spatial spread, which of course is often what spread um, conjures up in our minds. So what have they been used for? Then also what models have been used for COVID-19 spread? And that's where I'll spend the bulk of my time. And then we'll talk a little bit about what the challenges are in modeling COVID-19. So these are the three uh, reasons we might use models uh, for disease spread. Um, and if you remember nothing else, um, I'm hoping that you'll remember these three points. Um, and they, they are linked together. But the first one I want to emphasize is that models are used to understand the properties of the epidemic and they're not to make precise point predictions. So there's been a lot of work with people trying to predict in a month or, uh, or even next week, how many uh, cases there might be and giving some precise number. And of course, being woefully inaccurate and, and, and embarrassingly so. And it's important that we're not, that's not our job uh, when we try to model an epidemic. We're trying to understand the properties of the epidemic. Um, and I'll, I'll amplify that a little bit later on. Uh, the models we use are, are to answer epidemiological questions of interest and so therefore must be informed by epidemiology. So we're not just trying to do some time series analysis, trying to extrapolate from the last few data points into the future, but we're saying there is a process happening here that we need to input into our model and it won't make sense otherwise. And so that's why we talk to epidemiologists and say what are the relevant uh, variables here, what are the uh, relevant processes here that we must implement to some degree in our models. And then finally, what we use models for uh, is to simulate possible future trajectories of the epidemic. So again, we're not trying to uh, pinpoint exactly what where things might be, but we're trying to look at a fan of future possibilities uh, to see where we might end up. And there's a great quote on Twitter, I wish I could find it, I couldn't find it, but talking about trying to prune off branches, future branches which are not advantageous. So if we can learn that from our model, we can know what control measures might prevent us from going along certain paths. So that's a really valuable part of using models. Okay, so let's talk about now what models have been used for COVID-19 spread. So there's essentially two main models. Um, I've listed three here and I'll explain that in a second. First of all, there's compartmental models. Uh, then there's what I call branching process models, sometimes also called generation time models. And then either of these can be uh, made more complex uh, uh, to also to answer more complex questions. Uh, and they can be brought into what might you might call network models, models with structured populations, um, individual based models, and that's where we can put some spatial structure in as well. So the first two are really the, the building blocks um, for, for the models uh, that get used. And I think it's important to point out that at each point, as we ask more and more um, uh, refined questions, we have to have more and more refined models. And that's why you'll see a sort of a, a gradual ramping up of the uh, complexity of the model as we go through. So, <clears throat> no, I did say I was a mathematician and a statistician, so there are going to be a few, well, actually, no, there's only three equations and one's recycled. So, in fact, this is it. This is all the maths you're going to see today. But I wanted to just put a little bit in here, uh, just so you get uh, an idea of some of these, uh, in this case, compartmental models. So, this is your, your classic compartmental model, uh, called SIR model, for obvious reasons. And so, people, individuals, move through the compa compartments of the model, uh, at a certain rate, so we'll talk about that in a second, but they can be in a susceptible class, so susceptible to infection. They can then move to an infected uh, class, which is in this case also identified as being the infectious class, 
uh, and then finally they might recover as well. So those are the compartments you move through. And the key idea, um, I've linked these compartments of arrows. So every time you see an arrow in this talk, there's gonna be some rate parameter associated with it. And this is the only slide in which I use in Greek. So in this case, I'm indicating that beta is the rate at which transmission happens, uh, and mu here is the rate at which recovery happens. In future, I'm just gonna have arrows, and you'll understand that there's a, probably at least one rate parameter associated with, with each arrow. Now the key idea then for uh, SIR model is to say what happens, how many, how do the numbers in those classes compartments change over time? And this is the fundamental equation. Um, as I said, this is the only one we're going to look at, but it's key, I think, to this uh, understanding of compartmental models. We want to say what's the change in the number of infected individuals? Well, there's two terms as a contribution, a positive contribution from people moving from the susceptible class into the infected class. And the key thing is this depends on how many people are susceptible and also how many people are infectious. So this is what's called a nonlinear term, which makes things more complicated. Um, and that gets multiplied by the change in time. So obviously the longer you wait, the more uh, you'll expect to see the number of infected increase. But there's also a decline. There'll be people moving out of the infected class into the recovered class. Uh, and that depends on how many people are in the infected class. So that's a, a negative contribution. So overall, that's the change in the number of people infected. And you can then obviously propagate that through to the change in the number of susceptible people and the change in the number of recovered people. But by itself, that's the key equation to the SIR model. And why I just stress this a little bit is that from this model, we can back out the basic reproduction number. So the, in an otherwise susceptible population, how many people one infected individual infect? And it can be computed as a ratio of those two rates. So this is the second equation. Uh, and you can see here, it's the ratio of the transmission rate beta to the recovery rate mu. So if the mu recovery rate is very small, it takes a long time to recover, then R0 will be quite big, as potentially, and if the transmission rate is high, also R0 will be high. So you can see how those two rates combine to, to give us R0. Okay, so let's see what it looks like when you do a, a uh, run the model. Uh, here I'm plotting in green the, the ratio of the number of susceptible, or sorry, the proportion of the number of susceptible people in the population. Uh, and in red, you've got a proportion of infected individuals. And you can see initially there's a definitely an exponential growth, which we expect to see in, it, in, in the, an epidemic, but then of course it, it peters out. The reason why it starts slowing down is because there are fewer susceptible people in the population. Uh, in this case, things level up at, at, over some time. And in fact, at the end, there's about 10% or just over of the population who are still susceptible. So this is um, for R0 is 2.5. So if you know some of the literature around COVID-19, 2.5 is sort of roughly where people think R0 is, uh, plus or minus. Uh, so you can see that it's uh, by left to its own devices, uh, COVID-19 is, is a very serious epidemic. Now, uh, it's not actually the, the, a great model, the SIR model, because we don't really expect people to become simultaneously infected and infectious at the same time. And so the workhorse of most models, uh, compartmental models for epidemics is the SEIR model. And so we're going to insert an extra compartment in here, which is the exposed compartment. So you move to becoming exposed and then subsequently at a certain rate, you become infectious. And at that point, of course, that you can start uh, infecting more individuals in the population. And then at some point you also recover. So this is the great thing about compartmental models. They're very extensible. You can add in more compartments and I'll show you some examples in a second. Um, but very early on, and this is, I think this is a very interesting paper, so I want to stress this read at our paper, it came out at the end of January 2020, and they used an SEIR model to uh, understand the properties of the epidemic emerging from uh, Hubei province. Uh, what's interesting about this is it used data up to January the 22nd, which is when controls are put in place in Wuhan. Uh, and this paper, the second version of the paper, came out on the 29th of January. So in fact, just within a few days, they had got the data and fit this model to estimate the parameters of the epidemic. Now, uh, one thing I will come back to is how important it is in these kind of models, you need to be able to um, investigate or observe the entire trend chain uh, of, of, the, of, the, of, the, um, of the model. So unfortunately, you don't really know if people become exposed. Well, some, subsequently you can, you can maybe find out some contact tracing and interviews uh, to find out when people might have been exposed. But in a short turnaround time, they had no idea when people have become exposed, they only knew when people were becoming infectious or recovering. So that was the only data they had. So they were kind of missing information about a key part of the process, which is going from exposed to infectious. So they just had to assume it. And they had some 
they looked at other coronaviruses and so on, and they said, well, we'll have to assume a latent period of four days, which turned out to be not too bad, uh, in fact. But then at the end after that, you can also estimate the infectious period, the time it takes you on average to recover, and they got 1.61 days, which to our minds now probably seems very, very small, but it's not as bad as it, so as it sounds, as I'll explain in a second. And then the key idea is that from those two numbers, they're able to estimate r -net. And so they got 3.11, which I would probably say now, is a bit on the high side, but if you look at the confidence interval, it's between 2.4 and 4.1. So right, really, the current numbers say 2.5 to 2.7. It, it captures those really well. So this really shows the advantage of having a, some data, a model, and that you can do something quite useful in a short amount of time, which is to show that this is a, a, a disease with, which has an epidemic potential. In fact, it will, with R0 as large as three, that's a very serious disease. So you might quibble later on, say it's actually 2.5, but that doesn't really substantially change our conclusion about this epidemic. Um, to get a better sense of what's happening in these models, it's quite useful to plot what I'm calling an infectivity profile. And the reason why it's not quite so clear from the compartmental model is that it does something kind of weird. It takes individuals and sort of smears them out. So they move from being uh, susceptible, then they become partially exposed, and they become partially, you know, partially infected. Uh, and so um, it's not that they move at one point uh, from one compartment to the other at a certain point in time. And so we can actually plot what the sort of, if you like, the smeared out individual looks like in terms of infectivity. And that's in this orange curve here based on the read at our uh, paper. Um, and it has, it's very typical of the SEI models that you become infectious straight away. Not that you're, you don't, not at a high value, but you, uh, that peak comes a bit later, um, but you become infectious straight away. And that's kind of uh, probably unlikely. In, in most diseases, um, and then you have quite a long tail. And in fact, the reason why, if one point, the infection period of 1.61 days, if it had been longer, which we kind of think it is, um, then in fact, this tail would be even worse. It'd be a much uh, fatter tail. So it was basically trying to compensate for the fact the model wasn't great at, at this point, early times, uh, and so it made some, uh, had, to, had to sort of constrain itself at later times. And what it was trying to do probably was trying to mimic this blue curve, which is now the more accepted, Infectivity profile, which comes from branching process models, which we'll talk about later. So, just a sort of caveat: when you see these numbers coming out of SEI models, they don't quite necessarily mean what you think they mean. Uh, if you plot the infectivity profile, you get a better sense of what it's implying about the epidemic. Okay, so those models I've discussed, I really didn't say, but in fact, they're called deterministic models because there's no actual randomness inherent in them, and we know that epidemics and most things in life are inherently random. So, a stochastic SIR model is a useful thing uh, to, to do. In fact, most models now would be, would be stochastic. So you can have a stochastic CIR model as well. Uh, anyway, so I just want to show you what happens here. So this is that recycled equation I warned you about. Instead of saying the change in I had these two contributions, a positive and a negative contribution, really what we're saying is the average change in I can be understood in this way. And in fact, in a well-described way, we also know what the fluctuations then will, will be in the change in I. So this is the key idea. And so instead of trying to show you math, I thought I'd show you some pictures. And here, all these little light green curves are the sort of proportional susceptibles in different simulations from this epidemic. And so you can see this inherent stochasticity in it. Sometimes they drop down quite quickly. Other times you see the proportion stays quite high and then drops down. Uh, but that bold green curve is the our original deterministic SIR model. So you see they sort of uh, 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 grouped around that, that curve. So on average, that seems to be the right thing, but of course you can get quite a bit of degree of variability. And one thing I really want to stress is that there's actually this horizontal green line here as well. This is a case in which there was an infected person, but they recovered before they infected anyone, just by chance, and therefore the epidemic stopped. And that's something that you never see in a, in a deterministic SIR model, and it's crucial uh, in, in epidemic models to understand that this uh, stochastic these fluctuations can actually lead to uh, ep epidemic extinction. Uh, only when you have what's four numbers of cases, but and that's the situation we're in in New Zealand at the moment. And so that's a, a key idea. And you can't get that idea from a deterministic SIR model. And I think the way you're stressed about this point too, every, every curve you're seeing here is from the same choice of parameters. So you can see how hard it is to estimate parameters. Each of those curves uh, comes from the same parameter value. So you can see they look very, very different, yet they will uh, sort of imply that it may be a hard job to actually estimate parameters, which is, which is actually the case. Okay, as I said, these compartmental models are extensible and uh, We've actually used these models uh, with adding some more compartments inside them to, to capture things like 
uh, asymptomatic transmission, um, include different stages, intermediate stages of infectivity, quarantining and so on. So it's quite nice, it's quite fun to play this game. You can sort of, it's like Lego, you put in uh, new, new blocks in various places. The key thing, of course, it's actually based on epidemiological evidence and con consultation with the experts. So here we put in a pre-symptomatic class. So this is a scenario where you, you're exposed, um, but you're not showing any symptoms yet, but you're still mildly infectious. And so that's a reasonable model uh, of COVID-19. And so that's something you'd like to include. Another option is that you have an asymptomatic class, uh, which is also um, infectious. So when someone becomes exposed, there's a sort of a bifurcation that happens. Either you become an asymptomatic carrier or you become infected and infectious with symptoms. Uh, and both of these classes are contributing to the spread of the epidemic, but maybe at different, different rates. And then both classes that eventually recover. So those kind of models are quite possible to spread. And you can also to use, and you can also, instead of having an asymptomatic class here, you can make this a super spreader class. People that seem to be much better at infecting others than others. Um, very hard, of course, if you're trying to estimate the parameters of this model, if you don't know the asymptomatic people, then you can't measure that part of the process. And so this is why there's still a lot of discussion about uh, the role of asymptomatic transmission of COVID-19. So there's been a couple of applications that I want to briefly mention. Um, now, Wilson et al. had a couple of papers that came up back to back using a stochastic compartmental model to quantify the efficacy of existing surveillance methods. Uh, so imagining a situation where there's only a few cases in the population, how long will it take for us to detect them using the current methods we, we have. Also flipping that around saying if we have lots of uh, days as we did in New Zealand with no cases, uh, how certain could we be that uh, COVID-19 has been eliminated? Okay, so there is a drawback with these compartmental models is that they assume an exponentially distributed waiting time in each compartment. So it's a bit of jargon here, but uh, it's just the, the nature of these models that they have a funny situation where the distribution, how long it takes to move to the next class, peaks at zero, which is a bit odd. Uh, and so sometimes it has some funny uh, um, outcomes, and that's one of the things you saw in that infectivity profile, how quickly you become infectious, which doesn't seem. Realistic, so that can be um, can be ameliorated by using intermediate uh, stages. But another approach, which is very nice, is the branching process method, which is inherently stochastic and basically it models the generation time directly. So here I'm showing a picture where an individual orange um, is infected, and we're seeing the chain of, of infections which happen subsequently. So the pink is the first generation, and then that generation of infections also led to the green generation of, of secondary infections, and then a Age information here. So that's a branching process, you can sort of see it quite vividly. The key thing to note here is that we're also saying that the infections happen at different times. So although the pink and all the first generation, when they happen is actually in different points in time, so we want to be able to model that. Um, and so the generations get jumbled up eventually. You can see, for example, here's a in this third generation occurring before a second generation. Really. But this is very easy to model uh, using branching processes. And the key idea here is that R0 now is the average number of people infected by each individual, uh, infected individual. That tells, sort of tells you on average how many branches you'd expect to see from each, each point in that graph. So this is the accepted um, generation time model based on a paper uh, by Freti et al, uh, which is based on that blue curve I showed you before, but now it's been turned into a form of a probability distribution. So it's a slightly misleading thing to do. It's not a probability distribution, uh, but it's just, if you sum up those red dots, you get one. Um, and if you want to convert that into a statement about the, um, how the branching process is going to run, you multiply it by R0. Uh, and then say, for example, at five days, we had 0.2. Here we multiply that by, say, 2.5, R0 will get a 0.5. And what it says that on average, on day five, you're going to infect uh, 0.5 people, okay? Which seems a bit ludicrous. What it really means is that there's a good chance it'll infect no one, but there's also a good chance it'll infect one person, uh, maybe even two. And overall, if you look, use this profile, on average, you'll be infecting 2.5 people. So this has been used, this has been found by Felix data uh, and more data that read it how didn't have at the time. So for example, they actually looked at um, the, uh, using contact data between, uh, to find the generation time between pairs, which is cru uh, crucial to determining the shape of that. So these have been applied um, quite extensively. Um, they can also be very easily gener uh, you know, extended, customized, uh, similar to compartmental models, but in a very useful kind of way. So for example, you can include um, 
you know, detection probability. What, what happens if someone gets sick but don't doesn't get tested, um, or the test itself doesn't report them as being positive? So it's very easy by tracking individuals through a branching process uh, to uh, include those kind of important effects. Um, this um, generation time model has been used extensively by the researchers at uh, Te Punaha Matatini, um, and have released a number of papers related to just the spread of COVID-19 in New Zealand. Uh, so Planck et al. in April talked about um, modeling the effect of the alert levels and showing the importance of fast case isolation. And Benning et al. recently have talked about, uh, estimated the effect of uh, a reproduction number during lockdown. Uh, and they found, for example, that uh, T was about 0.35 and alert level 4. So now it's time to just bring these together and then try to add some more sophistication to the models to answer the more sophisticated questions. We've been assuming homogeneous and well-mixed populations. And now we want to address questions like the spatial spread, um, age-dependent effects, and so on. And so this, this little diagram here is just to show you these could be cities uh, with epidemics occurring inside them. And because of contact or movement of people between the cities, then epidemics would be um, more augmented by a possible arrival of infected individuals. Or it could be groups in the population, different age groups, um, and the interactions between them uh, will be mediating uh, the disease as well. And because there's two arrows on these plots, there's two rates that you need to know about to understand how these uh, different class groups um, are, being, are interacting. And so there's been some interesting applications of this, and this is sort of, it does tie in a little bit to uh, the last talk by Angela. Um, so there's a tape and Patatini research has also looked at a structured model to understand possible age and healthcare inequities. Um, and this is because we know that um, COVID-19 is much more virulent in older age groups um, and understanding how the age groups interact with each other um, may help us understand uh, how well, help us understand how we can pre pre prevent that. Um, also access to health resources uh, is really key as well. So modeling that was an important part of this paper by Alex James and co-authors. Um, I should point out as well that um, to do this you need to have more information. So as a, always, every time you have a more sophisticated model you need more, more data in order to, to uh, estimate the parameters. And there is a, quite a bit of information in most countries now about how different age groups uh, interact with each other, what, what the contact rates are, so that's really important. There's also uh, been some experiments that have been done uh, using mobile phones and so on to, to track individuals anonymously, but to understand how people move. And we'll talk about that in a second as well. I should point out the Rio Dale also did include movement between cities in Hubei province. Uh, so that was a little bit more sophisticated than I gave them credit for uh, previously. And then finally, we've got individual-based models, which are really a detailed model. Sometimes they're called agent-based models, but they incorporate known behavior and movement of individuals. This is um, amazing, you can almost, you know, model entire populations. Um, key idea here is that these open circles are individuals in the population um, and they interact at locations. So the solid dots color coded are different locations and in fact there'll be lots of green dots and lots of blue dots of course. Um, and you'll see over here we've got a household all interacting in the same house um, but of course they also have interactions in other places so this person goes to work and that's where they meet someone who's infected and that's where a transmission event might occur and of course then they go home and might pass it on to their people in the household and then that person, one of their people goes to school and they might pass on. So you can sort of see how this happens. Um, these models include this really detailed individual level based understanding of how the epidemic may have evolved. Unfortunately, these require a lot of information. Not, there's not many places that have this, these kind of models uh, already set up, uh, but Australia is one of them. And so I'm just jumping to the second point here. Um, Australian census-based epidemic model has been up and running for quite some time. It's been used in the past with flu. And this was used in May to understand the effect of a number of control measures for COVID-19. Um, and they found out, Cheng et al, that school closures were unlikely to have a decisive effect because they found that, uh, based on data, that it seemed that children were not important uh, vectors of the disease. Uh, and then I mentioned Kachansky et al, uh, which is another interesting one, which was all, already developed uh, a few years ago on the BBC pandemic data set where volunteers agreed to Put, install an app on their phone, which use Bluetooth to, 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 re, to notice when it came in close contact with someone else using the app, and they use this to um, understand the efficacy of isolation and various other control measures to reduce uh, transmission of SARS coronavirus 2. 
So the last part then, what are the challenges of modeling COVID-19? Um, in some ways, these are actually challenges for any modeling of disease spread. The, the system itself, the disease system is dynamic, and it's stochastic, um, it has exponential behavior, and it's actually really hard to model that behavior. So anyone who tells you differently is trying to sell you something. Um, and that, that's why uh, we've seen some um, rather erroneous uh, predictions about the future course of COVID-19. Um, one other thing is that, um, of course, epidemics seldom left to run the course, and so people change their behavior, or their central control measures are imposed, and that adds further complexity to sort of interpreting the data. Uh, that's uh, just always going to happen. Um, in the case of COVID-19, we still have questions around asymptomatic transmission, or is it pre-symptomatic transmission, or a combination of both, um, and so we're still uncertain about that. Uh, we do have always uncertainty in data. We have incomplete data, so I mentioned before we don't know, for example, when someone became exposed. We, maybe we can tell somewhat, um, maybe censored, not politically censored, but statistically censored. Uh, the data may be unreliable, it may be delayed getting to us, and so they always have to be incorporated into how we um, use the data to estimate the parameter of the model. And uncertainty in the parameters themselves is really key. So I, I, I've given you uncertainties in the estimates of R0 and RT, but the other parameters I sort of said are the incubation, mean incubation time is 5.5 days, as if this was set in stone. Of course, it's not. Um, that's just our best guess, and there's a confidence interval for that parameter as well. And so all these kind of uncertainties are important to, to incorporate. And there's a sort of round of sensitivity analysis which has to happen in any kind of model. And I thought I'd just chuck in one little thing at the end. What does pandemic readiness look like if you're a modeler? Um, you need to have a suite of models at hand, including pre adapted models. So by that I mean, Models a bit like the Australian census based epidemic model. If we have a, 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 a ground truth model of what individual behavior looks like, then of course we can uh, very quickly utilize it to understand how control measures will affect the spread of a disease. We need to know in advance what data will be needed. So once we know the model, we can ask what data we need to estimate its parameters. And then we have to have therefore the ability to collect that data. So that's really important. I think a few commentators have made this point, but it's really data which is so important, um, knowing when people have tested, if they've been tested, what the result was, where they were, uh, where they came from. These are all really crucial uh, to estimating uh, parameters. And so to having that in place is important. And the last comment is just around statistical computing. That's actually important too. Um, and maybe I'll come back to this in a second, but um, it needs to be in place. It's quite hard to quickly take these models, fit them, fit them to data. It doesn't happen overnight. And so that that sort of procedure has to be uh, ready and waiting for the next pandemic. And I just have a few references here at the end, papers I've talked about. Thank you, Matthew. Right, we'll have a few questions coming through in the meantime. Um, in terms of modelling for COVID-19, how different is it to modelling for other epidemics? Is it just a case of swapping out those Lego blocks? In a compartmental model? I think, yeah, well, of course I would say that, because um, I'm sort of invested in these kind of models. Um, if I move back in here. Yes, I think so. The, the, the key thing is that every, yeah, every, the arrangement of those blocks is different for every, every uh, a, a disease. And so you can't just, I mean, people very early on said, oh, it's just like flu, and of course it's not. So that's going to have an impact on how you model. And that's why you can't get to sit alongside epidemiologists. Uh, and jointly devise what the best kind of model will be in this case. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned obviously the importance of data. Your model is only going to be as reliable as the data you get. Do you find as the epidemic rolls along, it becomes easier and you have more confidence, more and more confidence in the model? I think so. With the, um, we have only have more confidence in the parameters. <laughs> um, whether we've got the right model, maybe I should have said that there's uncertainty in the model itself. Uh, and is that uh, capturing everything that's there. So mm -hmm. this is where simulation can be very useful because you can take your, your model that you've got your, you know, blood, sweat and tears to get the parameters for and you can run simulations on it. If they don't look like the epidemic that's happening, then you know you haven't, you haven't done something right. Yeah. And how do you take into account the cluster nature of COVID expansion in models? Yeah, that's a, that's a, a good point. So. Um, I, I did skip past saying that. Um, I mentioned, for example, that um, you need to multiply by, I'm not, actually, I'm not showing my screen, I'm showing it to myself. Anyway, 
Um, when you, I said, let's say our norm is 2.5, for example, and that would tell us on average how many people uh, an infected individual uh, would be um, would infect. But of course, we have a phenomenal super spreaders. And so instead of saying um, your value is up, it's 2.5, what we can say is, well, everyone's got their own individual R0. Here we go. Um, and uh, on average, it'll be 2.5, but it'll be something, you'd be basically a choosing from a distribution. So some people may be less than one, one less than one, other people are 15. You know, that's a possibility as well. So we have examples of the super spreader phenomenon in, in recently in South Korea and even in New Zealand. And so that, that can be corporate relatively straightforward into the model. Thank you, Dr. Matthew Perry. We have reached the end of today's webinar. Thanks once again to Associate Professor Angela Valentine and Dr. Matt Perry. And we will be back tomorrow at 12 for the ninth day in the COVID-19 masterclass. See you then. Namihi. <laughs>